Well, lots of moose loose around here, waiting for my call. In fact, the end of the line turned out to be a town called Moosonee, on the edge of the Arctic Ocean. Next morning, there was no genuine wildlife to be seen, just a small community of 1,400 people. It turned out to be one of the oldest settlements in all of Canada. For three centuries, the Cree Indians who live here have traded furs with the Hudson's Bay Company. It's quite an up-to-date little settlement. It's even got a street and a school bus, and both stop at the edge of town but the Cree cling stubbornly to their traditions. In many backyards, they were roasting geese and baking Indian bread to the sound of tape-recorded tribal powwow music. With a couple of days between trains, I got an intriguing invitation to a Cree religious ceremony on the edge of Hudson Bay. That night, on a lonely island, I found myself crouching in a huddle of Cree Indians preparing for an ancient tribal ceremony. The Indian name for it is a sweat lodge. It was led by Bob, a university-educated medicine man. This uh, sweat lodge was given to us through the creator. He created the willows that we're going to be using. He created the rocks that we're going to use. He created the water that we're going to use. There's nothing there that he didn't create. And he also created us. And we're just using what our ancestors were given for generations. And it's coming back. And it's young people like ourselves that are very into, into it, and it's up to us to carry this on. One by one, shadowy figures appeared, then disappeared into a kind of darkened hut. <laughs> Cameras are not allowed to record the ceremony, but I was invited to take part. In the sub-zero temperature, I stripped to my undershorts and crept back 10,000 years in time. What happened inside? It was pitch black, apart from some glowing red-hot stones. I was handed an Indian peace pipe, took a puff and passed it on. In the darkness, Someone ran hands over my sweating body in a kind of faith healing. Yet it was strangely moving too, for I glimpsed something I had to come to Canada to find. The possibility that people can preserve their traditional ways, distinct from other cultures around them, yet respect each other enough to share one country together. It was an inspiring vision or perhaps it was only a dream. Another day was another world. I had traveled south, then west, and caught another train. The iron road was taking me even further north, to Churchill on the doorstep of the Arctic. What's it like out there? It's wintry. It's a Canadian scene. Well, it certainly wasn't Florida. This part of Canada is big and bleak and barren. And again, only one thing holds it together. Spaghetti seems to be the Oh, I think I'll have a beer. 
I lunched with Dan Gurevich, the world's leading photographer of polar bears, and Eric Luke, a staff sergeant of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. I didn't want to be stationed in Churchill uh, when I was I was posted there. And, uh, I didn't have a choice in going, and I really resented the fact I was up there. And when I got there, I found out that uh, it was nothing like I thought it would be. Time almost stands still up there. You don't march the same drum you do anywhere else because weather controls all. And uh, as frustrating as that may be, there's a magical uh, mystery about it, and it's it's, it's fun. Outside, the telephone poles were practically horizontal because the ground is permanently frozen. The stunted trees barely survive. And the people who live out here seem just as tenacious. Most of this town was heading north to do their shopping. And there was delivery service for those who stayed behind. Life is hard out here. The Canadian novelist Margaret Atwood once wrote that while the American ethic is based on winning, the Canadian one is based on survival. In this part of Canada, I can see what she meant. Seasoned passengers settled in for the night, but for some of us, this was all new. As we rolled further and further north, I felt a strange restlessness. Something out there was calling to me. I called back. Next morning, we left the last tree behind. This is a desert in the deep freeze. Ahead was the end of the line. Churchill, polar bear capital of the planet. once a thriving port, shipping Canadian wheat directly to the Soviet Union across the Arctic Sea. These days, business is slow, and only a few ships come in each year before Hudson Bay freezes over. The population is shrinking, and eventually there may be no one left but the native people who lived here for more than 10,000 years. Just wonder. Bye bye. Most people in town were tourists, here to see the other species that's been gathering on the edge of Churchill since long before the town was built. Shall we go into the uh, trading post? Yeah, okay. But before I went looking for bear, I needed the right equipment. No, this is the trading post. Wow. Well stopped, eh? Yeah. And this uh, young lady, Penny Rawlings. Hello. Hi. Hello, Penny. How are you? Hi, How are you, Dan? We think we hug down south. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a problem, Penny. Cold ears. Oh, I guess you're going to have to buy some ear mouse. Let's try a hat. Okay. Okay. 
You like that one with the tail, eh? Well, what do you think? Whoa! You look like mean? the original Davy Crockett. See, the problem is I can't now put my own hat on, really, oh, can I? Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> but look at the little guy on there. He looks great. <laughs> yeah, well, let's go to the earmuff for it all. Let's okay. try it. Okay, how decadent do you want to be here? We've got Norwegian blue fox. We've got mink. How about some coyote? That would match the rough on your jacket there. Good. It's me. It's you. It's me. Oh, yeah, it's me. you like those? Okay, good. I think that solves the problem. And so I was off to look for bear. Sixteen of them were cooped up inside a polar bear jail, built to detain impulsive bears who wander into town uninvited. Eventually, these jail bears would be turned loose. For now, they're locked up in the cooler. but there's plenty more where they came from, right on the edge of town. These bears looked quite friendly, but some locals were there to make sure they didn't get too friendly. As long as we stay on the perimeter, that's all right, you know? A playful tap from a 1,200-pound polar bear could be distinctly hazardous to your health. When one brawny Bruin came too close, visitors were asked to step inside while experts kept the peace. Okay, people that are uh, not essential maybe move just, you know, out of the working area. Oh, that's a big one. I wouldn't want to pick a fight with him. They were only firing blanks, but fortunately, the bears didn't know that. Seeing these handsome beasts relaxing in the sunshine reminded me of their unfortunate colleagues doing time back in the jail. Okay, wakey, wakey, rise and shine. Winter's coming, you'll be out soon. Sixteen bears and not a growl. It didn't make sense. Suddenly, it did. The bears weren't asleep, and they certainly weren't dead. They were zonked out on tranquilizers. The Canadian Wildlife Service was running them out of town. It was Operation Bear Lift. fly three bears at a time. They are transported a couple of hundred miles out of town. Hopefully, when they wake up, they won't walk straight back. And speaking of leaving town, I had a train to catch. There's a big steel rail train rolling down the tracks. I was heading back for the sunnier south entertained by Bill Hoffmeister, the singing baggage man. Nobody saw me leaving, it was the only thing to do. Started riding on the rocking top of a boxcar painted blue. Must be a lot of pain inside my head. To have the rocking top on the boxcar painted blue become a bed. Everything.
feeling so confusing I can't believe it's true How could everything go and change so much Simply losing you Like a man gone blind I've been trying to find the end of a tangle thread Starting with the angry things you said I know I'm quite a sight of rolling in the night with a rain dripping from my hat. But a broken heart don't care about here, Bill. Busted flat. You can sit around and play that guitar all day. But one more round, that's it. Okay. Thirty hours and a thousand miles later, I was back among the bright lights, but I had no time to lose. Well, there's a big steel rail train rolling down the tracks. I had left the frozen north of Churchill far behind and rejoined the main Trans-Canadian line, leading west towards the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific Ocean. Get to where she's going, I don't know what I'm gonna do. As dawn broke, the snow and the trees had vanished, and I was under the enormous sky of the prairies. Of a box sky. It was the wheat-growing province of Saskatchewan, and my next stop, a town called Swift Current. It was six in the morning in Swift Current. Not many people about, except some Hutterites, members of a religious farming community whose principles obviously include getting an early start. The prairie's isolation from the outside world seems to have helped them preserve their way of life. Maybe it's the same isolation that makes radio so popular out here. Slip right through my hand. Art Wallman is the king of prairie radio. Oh, it's a great job. You know, you hear the kind of music you like and you sing along and... From his wheelchair, Art runs Saskatchewan's most popular radio show. It's called the Tractor Line because many of his regular callers are listening in their tractors. Calendar coming up, and Buck Owens is going to be our star on that one. Right now, though, let's go to the Tractor Line and see if we got. Hello there. Yes, how are you doing today? By golly, if it is an Aubrey Putnam, how in the world are you doing, Aubrey? Well, we're doing all right here, you know. You and Aggie, right? Well, Aggie said to phone you up. She's out on the tractor right now, doing a little fall tilling, you know. All right. She's got her radio on, and you're coming in pretty good on her tractor there. She, well, that's good. Anyway, she's going to be coming in pretty soon. She's got to she's gotta get the turkeys in before dark, or they start roosting in the neighbor's trees, you know. These are the youngest-looking towns I saw in Canada. In fact, there's nothing older than the railroad out here, because settlers had no way of getting here until the railway connected the prairies to the outside world. He said, now, this train, it is bound to glory. This train. To a visitor, this is the part of Canada that looks most like the United States. There is no natural separation at all between the wheat lands of the two countries. But this train defied geography. by taking the almost impossible route east-west, Canada's patriotic direction. The rails tied the Canadian prairies to the oceans and to world markets, and stitched Canada together as one country. 
without this string Don't carry no backslide This string Now, the train service to many of these towns was being closed down. And I couldn't help but wonder. What protected Western Canada from the powerful pull of its southern neighbor now that the east-west link is broken? It is bad. This train no longer carries cattle out of prairie towns like Mancota, Saskatchewan. Today, they go by truck, and many of them go south to markets in the U.S., just a few miles down the road. In fact, I had to look hard to see that this wasn't the American Midwest. Not only do these cowboys look the same as their southern neighbors, it turns out they dislike the same people. The all-powerful eastern banks and supermarket bosses who set the prices here. I could see American and Canadian cowboys use the same silent language. understand the language. One false move, and you could wind up earning 5,000 pounds of T-bone steak. These people live so far from the rest of Canada, and so close to their American neighbors, that national lines can get blurred. People are saying the same thing as us, the same problems. And they have their problems with the government all in the east. And West gets the short end of the stick there the same way. Instead of the, the border going east and west, it should have went north and south. Like, it, it wouldn't matter to me if, if Canada were to become a part of the States or, you know. That's, I think being an American would be just as great as being a Canadian. again, rolling along beside the U.S. border with a nagging thought. On the map, Canada looked so solid. On the ground, it felt so fragile. Perhaps the only thing really Canadian out here was this train. And even as I traveled, the morning paper told me the train I was on was closing down behind me. Towns that owed their very existence to the railway, Swift Current, Medicine Hat, Moose Jaw, would soon have no train at all. Among the first casualties was going to be our engineer, who'd given his life to the railway. I came to Medicine Hat, I was 17 years old, and I was looking for a job. October the 22nd, 1947, I started in the railroad. <laughs> This, ra this railway right here, passenger service, is the history of this country, you know? That's what made this country. It's, it's, it's the railway that brought the people in here that made this country, you know? All these farms out here. Originally, these people came on the railway. Crossing Canada by train, I felt I was sitting in the seats of the pioneers. The train was a rolling classroom 
teaching generations of Canadians their history and geography. Animal? No. Animal? God? I think you'd like to eat one of those for your like breakfast. Shredded. Big shredded wheat. Yeah, they like <laughs> shredded wheat. Put that on your plate. You'd have to have lots of milk, and you'd have to have a whole cow. Yeah. Even the endless Canadian prairies do have an end. A full day out of swift current, we sighted a line of mountains growing out of the horizon. The legendary Canadian Rockies. Beaver, yeah. Just like Jesse's beavers, eh? The train was filling up with some new and interesting faces. These Japanese tourists filled a whole car. These are the mountains that made this train world famous, or maybe the other way around. And I was pulling into the railway's most famous stop. Anyone who's heard of Canada has heard of Banff, an elegant European-style spa that's been a playground of the international train set, the aristocrats, ordinary millionaires, and other members of the ruling class who've been taking the waters here since the days of Queen Victoria. But who, I wondered, comes here now? Banff is still a magnet for tourists looking for elegant living and beautiful scenery. But now they come across the Pacific instead of the Atlantic. Many of them are opening businesses and settling in. As always, the new pioneers are getting a friendly welcome from the natives. Banff seemed like a good chance to pick up a souvenir of Canada, although that one was a bit big for my suitcase. Instead, I chose the Japanese tourists' all-purpose favorite, a beaver dressed in a Mountie uniform. I had an opportunity to try some Japanese, since the sales girls spoke little English, despite eight years in Canada. They told me that was part of the reason they liked it here. They could escape the big city pressures of Japan and create a home here, speaking Japanese all day in the Canadian mountains. Before I left Banff, I had a stroke of luck. With time running out, I was still keen to test my moose calling skills. These beasts, whatever they were, looked like a receptive audience. All I risked was a little embarrassment. It was the story of my life. Don't call us, we'll call you. And so I left on the final leg of my journey through the last and greatest of the railway's triumphs. The crossing of the Canadian Rockies. Our conductor, Lloyd Metcalf, had been giving a running commentary on the trip through the mountains for a quarter of a century. That's the mountain that's on the back of your $20 bill right now. 
Lake Louise would be right over here, and this is behind, and we come up and around. It's, but that's the one that's on the back of our $20 bill today. He spent much of the trip time? giving the official time from his railwayman's pocket watch. <laughs> well, it's still, it's still 1637. It would still be 1637. <laughs> <laughs> like Meanwhile, up in front, a young man was living out every boy's fantasy. He was playing with a real train. steam engine was sort of like it was alive, you know, it, uh, you always treated it as such. We had to shovel coal when I first started, and, uh, the crack of the stack, uh, the, the working and the exhaust. Oh, you go through the country at night, and uh, that old steam engine was uh, really uh, barking, you might say, and uh, just made you feel like it was alive. I guess them days are gone. This renowned train through the Rockies will continue to operate one day a week, but only in summer as an expensive package tour. The regular passenger service was terminated shortly after my trip. The train that plied its way through the Canadian Rockies every day for a hundred years has made its last regular run. My last night on the train, there was a subdued atmosphere. Some of the staff were wearing black armbands. This black armband symbolizes not only the, the end of my career, it and symbolizes the death of an era in, in rail travel. It's an institution. You talk about, you talk to people. I remember as a kid, we grew up, my mom and dad lived on the CPR main line. I remember as a kid, standing out there watching the Canadian flash by when it was brand new. And they had the half doors open and all the porters were out, all dressed in white, decked in white. They looked so great. And I always thought, when I grew up, I'd love to work on a railroad. Little did I know that 30 years later, I'd be doing it. 30 years of history because they don't think they're making money. Do we have to make money to keep something like this world? You know, this governments all over the world piss money up the wall on, on a lot more frivolous things than a, than a national railroad. And they're gonna, I just can't believe that they would destroy it. The national dream. It's disgusting. I gotta go to work.
reached Vancouver, the long trip was over, perhaps forever. I'd started at the Atlantic and reached the Pacific, a whole continent away. In all, I'd traveled more than 7,000 miles. My own home in Australia was far across the sea, but I felt very much at home here, too. I suspected I'd fit in well, make quite a good Canadian. Somewhere inside me, I still heard the call of the wild. And someday, I'm going to get it right. Hope you've enjoyed last train.